Hi, I'm Michael Cashew. And I'm Adi Cashew, and you're listening to The WAG Podcast. This podcast is about health, wellness, and personal development. Each episode is a short conversation between Adi and I on a single topic with actionable steps. We cover everything from food, mindset, fitness, and relationships. We started WAG because of the way health and fitness changed our lives, so we hope to share a tool or two that helps you along your way. Hey. Hey. Welcome back. Today's Today, episode is today's about relationships. Today's episode is about relationships. Yeah. People love when we do episodes on relationships. So today we're talking about, we haven't done a relationship podcast in a while. And today we're talking about some a new exercise that we kind of stumbled upon and what we're doing in our relationship to learn more about each other and stay connected and continue to love each other the way that we want to. Let's just get right into it. Yeah. So a few nights ago, we had a date night and we had planned to, we're in, we're currently in isolation still. And so our date night was going to consist of making dinner and playing board games together. Yeehaw. And board games are fun. Yeah, I know. Anyway, we decided to call an audible. Uh, We received these exercises from this couple called Gay and Katie Hendricks, who are authors. They're like relationship gurus, really. Mm -hmm. Super, super famous. They're like Oprah's people that she goes to for relationship advice. They wrote her favorite relationship book of all time called Getting the Love You Want. They also wrote a book called Conscious Loving. And they have a new book called Conscious Loving Ever After. I don't know if it's new, but that's the one the video series is Mm -hmm. about. And they are definitely preaching and teaching about some practices that can really help you have a fulfilling and happy relationship. It's pretty amazing. So we decided that we were going to watch one of the videos. There's like a number of different exercises and we will link to the page where you can do these exercises yourself. But we decided that we were going to watch one of the videos and we thought that it was just going to be like, watch a 20 minute video, have a short little conversation. And it ended up being this like 30 to 60 minute thing where we journaled and then we talked about it and we had some huge insights and aha moments about our relationship. And before we get into the specific exercise, I want to talk a little bit about why we do this type of thing in the first place. In general, I think we treat our relationship like it's a, like we're a professional sports team, like a, a professional an, a professional athlete or performer in any area. They don't wait until something is broken to get better. And we've always treated our relationship like that. We are, as of you know, the time that that exercise happened, that date night, we were on great terms. Nothing was broken. We weren't fighting or anything, but we chose to do something that might be a little uncomfortable and we thought would bring us even closer together and would really foster intimacy. Yeah. I actually, so I posted about it in my story the other day on Instagram and I got a question that might be interesting for right here to acknowledge. And the question was, do these conversations ever lead to arguments or conflict. And I wouldn't say that they never do, but I also want to say that it's, it does rarely happen. Like very rarely does that lead, does does a conversation like this lead to an actual conflict? And that's because, and I suggest that you guys do this too, if you're going to do the exercise, when you go into something like this, that might be uncomfortable and you might have to bring up something about the other that they could get defensive about. And you might have to hear something that you might get defensive about. It's important that the space that you create is a safe space, meaning that we've agreed that we're going to go into this uncomfortable space together. And that means we're, if anything like that comes up, we're not getting defensive. Mm -hmm. We are staying calm. We're going to talk about it. And this, we've made a commitment that this is not the opportunity to attack the other person. So I'm not coming into this conversation from the intention of trying to hurt Michael. Like we're, we're in a good place. It's actually better to do these things from a good place because that's way less likely to happen um, of me if trying. already yeah. have tension. Right. So if we already like had a, super, a, a huge tension in our relationship and we're going into an exercise that's supposed to be just informative and to get to know each other a little bit better, I might unconsciously be like, I want to I hurt you because I'm hurting. 
And so we're in a good place in this. And it's important that there is at least some ground rules of this doesn't lead to conflict. And if anything starts to escalate, you end what's going on and get back to being regulated and 100% with one another. Mm -hmm. So some reasons, other reasons that we do things like this is it brings more intimacy into the relationship. It also brings in novelty, like some newness. We get to discover brand new things about each other, which is, it feels amazing. Yeah. We get so to discover awesome. brand new things about ourselves. It really stokes growth. And one of the things that I love is it brings me back to that feeling of being like deeply in love with a D, which is like. It, you know, like similar to the first year that we were together and like we were just obsessed with each other. The other could do no wrong. And over time, there can be moments where we feel a little disconnected, right? And we forget how much we love each other. And this brings me back to that state. Yeah. It also, it is, there's something so intimate about, especially in an exercise like this, that's not straight up. I'm pointing out things I want you to change. You're pointing out things that you, we're taking accountability for our own things in the relationship. And there's something really, it makes you love the other person more when they're like, I notice these things I'm doing and I want to be better. Yeah. It just brings you so much closer together. And not that you have to do things like this, but I think if you're not having at least these types of conversations, whether in a formal exercise or not, I think it can lead to complacency in the relationship, even atrophy, where the relationship starts to decline or move away and you feel disconnected from one another. It could end up, you just don't have fun around the other person because you're feeling disconnected. It can definitely get in the way of your sex life if you're not feeling super Yeah, connected. and you can also end up in, like you love your partner and you deeply are connected to them, but you kind of feel like roommates instead of like your husband and wife. And there's, you want to avoid that for sure. And these conversations can help with that. So this exercise is called the rule of three. And we're going to explain how the exercise goes. And then we'll give some specific examples that we brought up the other night. Yeah. I want to talk about the rule of three too. The reason why it's called the rule of three, Katie in the video is the one who explained it. And I would suggest doing this exercise watching that video because she explains every question. There's a couple in the video that does the exercises with them and you can get a lot of context around what she's thinking and why they put these together. So I, I would suggest that. She talks about it being the rule of three because it takes three data points on a graph to notice a trend. Less than three, it's not necessarily a trend and more than three, it definitely is, but at least three to be able to see a trend. And so we're trying to notice trends in our relationship. So I kind of thought that was interesting. Sweet. Okay, so number one, uh, well, I should, I should say this before. The rule of three is a number of questions that you are to do together. Uh, we recommend setting aside like probably 60 minutes. Mm -hmm. Both have a journal or some pieces of paper and something to write with. And you're going to, there are four questions and you're each going to answer each of the questions fully and then at the end of all of the questions, then you can share with each other. Yeah, that's how we did it for sure. And you'll understand why once we go through the questions. So number one is what have you complained about three or more times in the relationship that still hasn't resolved? I think that one's pretty self-explanatory. Number two, how have you enabled or supported your partner in continuing to do that thing that you're complaining about? Mm -hmm. Yes. Number three. If you weren't using that energy to complain about that thing, what else could you use that creative energy towards? So this is, this one needs a little bit of explanation. So for instance, I'll go into mine and then you can share yours at the end. I think it'll help, help me. Well, let's just go through points. Let's go through the examples of all of them. So let's just read all the questions and then we're going to give an example for each one okay. and then it'll make more sense. Okay, so number four is what's one small action step you can take in the next 24 hours towards that creative purpose? So here is, here is my example. So the thing that I've complained about three or more times in the relationship is that I would complain about a D asking me if I had done things over and over and over. <laughs> I've complained about this so many times. How have you enabled or supported your partner in continuing to do that thing? Number one is I forget things all the time. So I haven't <laughs> earned her trust in that way. And 
a huge insight that I had as I was filling these questions out is I noticed that there are some, like any really important things, I don't really forget ever. Right. If it's something that I deem as really a, like a simple task, like maybe a simple household mm-hmm. chore or errand. Yeah, and I think everything is important. So. I don't I don't treat it in my mind with the same level of importance or respect. And so to be really specific, like if something's important to me, I have a task management system that I use. Uh, you know, I have an app on my phone and I have a whole system for getting things done. And if it's simple enough, sometimes I just forget to put it in there and I straight up forget about it. And I do, I've done this unconsciously for probably my entire life. Mm-hmm. I just file things away in separate areas in my mind. And so the way that I'm enabling it is I'm filing it in my mind as like, this is so simple. There's no way I'll forget it. But then I end up forgetting it over and over and over. And that causes her to have to ask because she knows if I don't ask, there's a there's a large possibility that he might forget this this mm-hmm. little small thing. <laughs> and another thing I, I realized was when she would ask me, I would be immediately more concerned with her distrust in me and completely caught up in her distrust in me than actually listening to her the asking request. me the, the yeah. request and then and then you know searching through my brain and asking did i do the thing if not do i have do, do am i, have am I sure that i will get it done i would just get caught up on how dare you not trust me mm-hmm. huge insight <laughs> if you weren't using that creative energy to complain about that thing what else could you use that creative energy towards so this creative energy thing it doesn't have to be directly related to what the thing I'm complaining about is. So if I wasn't using that energy, where could I use it instead? I could, one, I could just be more present in life in general and and be happier in general. I could invite you into deeper conversations with me because I'm I'm just more present and more lighthearted rather than being caught up, like complaining about you in my head. I can make both of us laugh and stuff like that. And finally, what's one small action step you can take in the next 24 hours towards that creative purpose? And my action step is to focus on, like early on in our relationship, well, I'll I'll back up even further. I really take pride in my ability to ask great questions. And early on in our relationship, I think I was like way more... I was, I was courting a D and I was like trying harder. And so I think I asked a lot of great questions that led to awesome conversations for us. And over time, I've taken her for granted in a lot of ways and get just a little like I'm, I'm distracted. Or I'm not trying to delight her or I'm not trying to get to know her better sometimes. And so the the action step is just to start asking better questions more often and getting creative about her life and her day. You did that last night, actually. Yeah, I noticed. And so for for the question three that you thought needed more clarification, so if you're not using that energy towards complaining about that thing, what else could you use that creative energy towards? So the where you would use that energy towards doesn't have to be related to the complaint at all because it's taking you away from the complaining. So you're, if you're not using the energy towards complaining, could you go hang out with your friends? Could you go work on a new hobby? Like it's not necessarily about, it's just now you've gotten all this energy back, what can you do with it? Mm-hmm. And if you do things that you want to do or that take you away from complaining, it actually kind of dissipates the complaint in the first place because the complaint isn't happening. And then I bet your partner will show up differently when you're doing more other things versus complaining. So that's kind of like a little bit more clarification there. And we'll talk about afterwards what this experience felt like for us after we went through this and what kind of insights we got. Mine The first question, what have you complained about three or more times in the relationship that still has not resolved? Uh, A consistent complaint that has not resolved of mine is not getting attention from Michael slash him not taking care of me in certain moments. It's just like, it's not the exact kind of, it's a little bit more vague. Like it's not the exact kind of attention I want. It's not enough attention. It's not, 
you're, you, it feels like it's like something around like you're taking care of you, but you're not taking care of me. Some story around that. And how am I enabling or supporting you in continuing to do that? Well, I think in the first place, I don't ask for attention or I don't ask you to take care of me very explicitly. And I just assume like, oh, you should take care of me in this moment or you should be thinking about me and this should matter to you. Like a lot of shoulds, which is, that's the story in my head is like, oh my gosh, he doesn't even, and I'll even, I'll even play these little games. Like I'm going to wait and see how long it takes him to even pay attention to me. Hmm. And that's just a little game I'm playing. That's totally unfair because Michael's not in on the game. And if he was in on the game, he would pay attention to me sooner. So I don't think I bring you in on these little games I'm playing in my head or the fact that it, in this moment, it even matters to me. And I can approach you in a way that you're like, whoa, you're right. I do want to take care of you right now, or mm. I do want to pay attention to you. Or you can let me know why you're not, like what's going on with you. Because you're a lot more internal than me. So there could be something going on with you that I just don't know about. And that could be taking your attention. And I might want to be there to support you instead of feeling like you need to support me. Mm -hmm. So that's definitely how I've been enabling. And another thing is that in general... I approach complaining towards Michael in the way that I've learned from my family, I feel like. I feel like my whole family kind of complains in this kind of way where it's like I want attention right now. And it doesn't really matter if you give me a good kind of attention or a bad kind of attention. So I will poke the bear until he says some growls at me or bites me or like I'll keep poking, you know, I'll keep poking and I'm trying to get anything out of you versus so then that in your case instead of instead of us resolving what's going on or having a useful conversation you kind of can get irritated with me and that actually can lead you to withdraw like your tendency is to withdraw so i'm and supporting you not paying attention to me by doing the thing that causes you to not pay attention to me cuz you need to withdraw and get space and come to me like fully present, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm definitely enabling in a lot of ways. And instead I could just come to you regulated and softer. And the best times are when I come to you soft and I'm gentle and I tell you that I want to tell you about something that's bothering me or get your attention in some kind of way like that. And then I just tell you how I'm feeling, not in a blamey, judgmental way that's a lot more aggressive sometimes. Mm -hmm. I'm definitely pushier and more aggressive. And that's just like how I've always been. So it just doesn't work with you. So that's definitely how I'm enabling and supporting. And then if I wasn't using that energy to complain about that thing, what else could I be doing? So if I wasn't spending all this energy in my head complaining about Michael not paying attention to me, I could go and sit outside and do something that fills my own cup. I could take care of myself. I can, I've been realizing recently that if I just go and take a second and I sit on our front porch or I sit on our back porch and I just sit there for 10 minutes, I'm totally more regulated. And whatever I was annoyed about just isn't as big as it was before. It's just not that big of a deal. I could go work on an art project. I could go do hang out with some of my friends and I could take that energy to go do that and, and let go of this like story that I have in my head. And then what is one small action step I can take within the next 24 hours? Um, there were two things, kind of maybe one of them is more surprising than the other, but one is to go sit out on the front and back porch, which has been amazing. I didn't even know I liked stuff like that, but I really, really do. And then the other one is to actually take care of myself in a way that's like putting on an outfit that's not, put, put, doesn't look like pajamas and putting on some makeup and doing my hair every once in a while. It seems really like silly or to me, it seems really silly, superficial, or just it shouldn't make that big of a difference. But I actually show up so differently when I put myself together and I think you give me more attention in those moments mm -hmm. and you like appreciate that too. So that's like an action step that I can take towards that. And I think it would um, help a lot. 
guys, we had an amazing time it, and it was so surprising. It was an, we had an amazing time doing these exercises. One thing I want to mention is if you're not already in the habit of having these types of conversations or doing these exercises like this, I want you to know that there is a huge difference in identifying a way that you're being in the relationship that you're not proud of and owning it before like owning it yourself versus having someone say, you're not doing this correctly, right? The the feeling, there were like six or seven things that we both figured out, like we were contributing and supporting and enabling the thing that we're complaining about. Um, and it felt like there was such strength in being able to own it. On the other hand, if you had just come to me one day and said, you're not doing these six, these seven things right, I would have a totally different response. So I, I, I want you to be aware that you can have a, this can feel much different than you might think. It can be, it can feel really empowering. And like Adi was mentioning earlier in the show, when you see your partner being so forthcoming with their shortcomings or the way that they're being like sneaky unconsciously but but being sneaky about these things it is so attractive and sexy and we both left it just feeling so much more in love with each other yeah another couple of realizations that i had one there were some complaints that neither of us knew about which mm-hmm. was so mm-hmm. funny like cuz cuz i really compel you to take this very seriously like take some time to write your answers the first 2 3 or 4 are going to be obvious things that pop up in your mind then you get to 5 and 6 and 7 and you're like oh i didn't even you start realizing i didn't even realize that mm-hmm. i was complaining about that and some things pop up that your partner doesn't even know you're complaining about so that, that part was actually <laughs> It was really scary for me because I was like, oh shit, if I put this down, I might have to share it with her. (laughs) Don't even, don't, I can't even say, don't, yeah, don't worry about that. Write down all of the little things. And if it comes up as like a word or an image, just put whatever you can because some of these little complaints that we have about each other aren't really fully formed. And so you can take a really quick approach to just jotting those complaints down. Yeah. Another thing that was really powerful for me is I, um, and Katie mentioned it in the video, is when you're in an intimate relationship with somebody, you kind of feel like you have the right to complain about things. And we think that complaining about things is going to lead to resolution. And going through this exercise, it was so obvious by the end of it that to get resolution it's not complaining. Like me complaining, I was noticing that my complaining was just adding to the complaint still living. It was giving the complaint life. And so if I wanted this complaint to go away and resolve, I had to change the way that I was being and complaining is definitely not helping the situation. Mm -hmm. So it was not the most, I mean, this is why these complaints continue to persist in large part because of my contribution and Mm -hmm. enabling of them. And so that was a huge, huge eye opener for me. And then a last realization for me was it was really crazy to see how our complaints mirror each other's. So like he complained about me reminding him about things all the time and I complained about Michael forgetting things all the time. (laughs) So it was just like you have these – it's – as much as these conversations can be really uncomfortable, there were so many moments in this conversation where we laughed. We were dying. And we were, we were laughing and you're just, you're just, you know, we're human and we're, we make mistakes sometimes and we don't show up like our best selves sometimes. And it's, it's just kind of funny. Like it's funny that every single one of my complaints, not every single one, but a lot of them mirrored Michael's. So that means if I stop complaining about one of them, his complaint could go away because if I stop complaining about Michael forgetting things all the time, then his complaint about me always reminding him just goes away. I'm not, cause I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm going to put the energy towards something else. So I thought it was just like such a cool exercise to do. And I'm excited to go through the other videos that they have there. All right. Enjoy guys. Get after it. Also, if you do this exercise and regardless of what you get out of it. If you do this exercise, reach out to us on uh, social media and let us know how it went. Yeah, we want to hear from you guys. Peace.
Thanks for joining us. Stay in touch by signing up for our newsletter at workingagainstgravity.com or on Instagram at workingagainstgravity. And don't forget to subscribe to us on iTunes, leave us a five-star review, and refer a friend. We'll be back next week with another episode. Talk to you then.